thank you very much for um, in, uh, allowing me to give a bird's eye view on my personal summary of the last year, um, what did happen in the treatment landscape. So these are my disclosures. Just to avoid uh, multiple overlaps with these brilliant talks earlier this morning, uh, I decided to focus on a few issues. One of that would be some current uh, concepts that we're talking about. Uh, then I will try to quickly allude to new substances approved, at least in the EMA and FDA rooms uh, in 2023. And then I will spend some time with the pipeline, notably not only for uh, MS, but also for NMOSD. But let me start with the current concepts. So what, where are we currently with progression as a potentially druggable um, target? And I think one of the most important contributions in science last year was really this publication from the International MS Consortium, which, as you may remember, did identify some MS susceptibility genes on the left-hand side, which are really enriched in immune compartments. So the novel part of this uh, part of research is really that they also identified genetic associations with progression, so really disease severity, which is really associated with the CNS compartment. And on the upper right-hand panel, you see that a specific severity variant is really associated with a disease um, progression in terms of uh, motor milestones. And also histopathologically, you see an uh, accumulation of brainstem and cortical lesions, a finding which was uh, corroborated uh, in the Netherlands, a brain bank presented at Ectrams 2023, where histopathologically colleagues observed an increased level of activated microglia and acute axonal damage, among other findings. Now, talking about histopathology, the, there are major characteristics of progressive MS. For example, slowly expanding lesions on the left panel, very up in the red circle, meningeal inflammation we've been talking about for quite some while, but also, of course, what I mentioned before, widespread microglial activation. I think the major part of that slide is these are not qualitative differences across MS phenotypes, but we are really talking about gradual, more quantitative differences. In that, yes, there is an overrepresentation of these different histopathological changes in progressive MS phenotypes. However, this is not exclusive, but it's just more uh, than the relapsing phenotypes. What does that potentially mean? It means that, yes, we probably do have different sort of um, leading immunopathomechanisms on the left-hand side with relapsing MS, with acute focal inflammation on the middle panel, with the progressive MS, with a more secluded, you've heard that earlier this morning, um, uh, uh, innate immunity-driven inflammation. But the point is really here from this slide, this, is, this may really be overlapping, and this may not be mutually exclusive pathomechanisms, indicating that we really, if we want to try to tackle all these pathomechanisms, we need to tackle different pathomechanisms um, all at once. How can we potentially clinically, clinically translate this? And, uh, especially also during ECTRIMS last year, uh, of course, silent progression or the uh, term coined by uh, Ludwig Kapos's um, uh, uh, publications, PERA, progression independent of relapse activity, may somehow represent what I try to describe histopathologically. So what is this? What the, one of the initial findings of the San Francisco group was really that you, if you had a relapse, then yes, it may be associated with a temporary transient disability progression at one year, but latest, if you look at five years on the upper right-hand panel, uh, there is no association with disability progression anymore. Now, meanwhile, I think it's clearly accepted that this phenomenon exists, and it does exist early on. So after, first, uh, after a first demyelinating event, 
um, the Barcelona cohort has shown that yes, there is a relatively early uh, possibility of PERA, and this also in this cohort is associated with worse disease outcome. However, the devil is in the detail, and this is a very beautiful um, overview of the Basel group who discuss the caveats and the pitfalls of uh, the, the, this concept. And one caveat is simply, of course, the definition. Just look at the left-hand side graph, right? If you imagine we have a first demyelinating event and want to do a clinical trial, then we do randomize our patients within 30 days, ideally. Then you have a fixed baseline, the time point baseline uh, on the left-hand side, right? Which is within 30 days of the relapse onset. However, hopefully the relapse symptoms and signs will improve, leading to an uh, improved EDSS. So when at the time point number C, you do again an EDSS assessment, then compared to the slash slash fixed baseline, um, there's just no meaningful difference. Whereas, after sort of improvement of the initial relapse symptoms and signs, there, of course, is a meaningful difference. So, really, the devil is in the t detail of the de definitions. And in a um, Austrian-Swiss cohort of PPMS patients, we try to quantify that. And Stefanie Marti, who's also in the room, tried to do that. And just to make this long story very short, depending on really the different definitions, there is an amazing variability of the outcome parameters. So the event rates would differ between 28 to 82 percent, and the time to progression would differ and vary from 500 days to more than 2,600 days. And there are multiple um, uh, definitions that you can play with. And Steffi Marti set up this app. The major issue really here is, again, uh, we urgently need to somehow uh, converge on a, uh, a well-respected definition. Now, um, how about individualization of the risk of PERA and RO? And again, here's the issue of the relative contribution, maybe according to age. And I think there are two messages here in the Italian uh, MS registry. One of that is on the far, far left-hand side. Yes, probably something like meaningful and contributing PERA does occur already in uh, pediatric MS patients at the age between 10 and 20. This relative contribution increases with age. This is clear, but it's not negligible in uh, the younger population. Likewise, the relapse-associated worsening is, of course, somewhat more prevalent and more meaningful in the younger age decades. However, by far, is not meaningless and negligible in the elderly patients. So what I'm trying to say in here is, again, reflecting uh, back on, on what I tried to introduce during the, the initial slides, um, really it's an interplay between potentially different pathomechanisms. What can we do about it? The currently only uh, aspect that we're having is probably an early treatment. And again, here also in this cohort, even if you look at the PERA compartment, a relatively early treatment start is the only factor here uh, which is associated with a better outcome. Talking about age, just like a very quick overview on what is happening in Switzerland and the different approval situation. We did hear about the risk, we will hear about the pregnancy. Let me just quickly focus on the age, and uh, Professor Peel has already alluded to that, so you know in essence what he said. Um, and he said that uh, current meta-analysis show really that in elderly patients, uh, our current disease-modifying treatments work less well. There's a caveat in all this because this, for example, is um, re uh, refined to uh, uh, phase three clinical trials, which of course you know that, do have an exclusion limit, do focus on um, other uh, aspects and younger patients, but nevertheless, it's quite clear there is a difference, and we heard the age difference before, which would exclude, I would say, looking from here, more than, more than half of ours, uh, the age threshold is 40 
uh, for this kind of analysis. But regardless of what you look at, if you look at 47 or 53, what different um, analysis did, the picture remains the same. Why is this? And this is, has also been alluded to by uh, Frederick, because it's a benefit-risk or risk-benefit um, aspect. I'm not going to go through of this. But yes, there are, of course, age-associated specific risk factors Issues that we sometimes potentially uh, tend to neglect, for example, the uh, hypertension in fingolimod or also terafunamide-treated uh, patients. However, the data when it comes to treatment efficacy in elderly is not as straightforward, straightforward one has to say. So this is an um, analysis of the MS base cohort, which is certainly uh, currently the largest um, real-world uh, cohort, as you know and quite uh, foreseen and corrobor corroborating other data that we've seen before. Yes, uh, the treatment effect of disease-modifying treatment, and here we're talking mostly about platform treatment, is strongest with lowest EDSS and uh, low relapse rate. That makes really sense. However, if you look at this um, second line, there does not appear to be a major difference uh, according to the different age strata they, they put up in here. So what I'm trying to say is that this is certainly a field of discussion. However, if anything at all, the uh, um, differences appear not to be as robust as um, to really justify to say, you know, everyone above 40, 47, 53 should be neglected uh, in terms of treatment. Now, we quickly heard about this aspect as well, and this is something we have been discussing for ages now, it's certainly as long as I remember talking about disease-modifying treatments. So how about discontinuation? And this is the first quite small study, which has, has different caveats, because again, here we're talking mostly about injectable platform treatments. However, what is the situation if you have patients above 55 and on average 62, uh, who for five years did not have any relapse under treatment, and for three years did not have any MRI lesions? And what you can observe on here is, yes, over two years, there is a slightly increased risk that these patients who discontinue treatment in comparison to patients who continued the treatment will experience disease activity mostly driven by new MRI lesions, one has to say. So because of statistical issues, because of the design as a non-inferiority trial, uh, one can only conclude that the non-inferiority of discontinuation cannot be proven. Uh, I think this is really the typical paradigm of, of what you've mentioned before. Is it benefit or risk, or is it risk of, or benefit? It really argues for individualization of our treatment decisions, especially in this elderly population. And one aspect comes on top of that. We only heard about side effects. Now, here's a side effect maybe for discontinuation, because there's a higher event rate for adverse events in those patients who discontinued. That may be this issue of you know, platform therapies interference being anti-infectious, antiviral, whatever. Not quite clear, but um, it's certainly in interesting to follow that up. Now, let me switch gears and try to look at new agents which were approved last year in MS and also NMOSD. One um, uh, molecule which has been approved uh, by the EMA um, um, more recently, and is uh, currently filed at Swiss Medic, is an anti-CD20 antibody, a novel one, with a novel binding epitope, and a engineering in the sugar side chains, which uh, is supposed to, and is also, also shown at least in vitro, to enhance a certain cytotoxicity mechanism. The, uh, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. What's the rationale behind it? A, you may be able to target also um, cells with lower CD20 expression. Uh, B, you may be able to reduce dosage. And C, you may be able to infuse more rapidly what you see on the left-hand side in one-hour infusion. What are the results? 
quite expectedly for an anti-CD20, we do see a convincing, I would say, reduction of the unrealized relapse rate. Also, when it comes to imaging parameters, I think it's, it's, uh, there's no major surprise. What we did not see, at least over this uh, relatively short uh, trial, is a difference in the EDSS progression. However, what we saw is not unexpectedly, of course, infusion-related side effects and, yes, a slight uh, increase of the infection rate. So, more to come maybe this year. <laughs> One aspect that I wanted to highlight is that this uh, study was compared with an active comparator, teraflunomide. And uh, you will hear about that later, but just, you know, um, you may memorize the relative um, relapse rates uh, under oblituximab and teraflunomide here in the teraflunomide control, it was about 0 0.2. Just memorize it. I will come back to that a bit later. Coming to NMOSD, I quickly want to highlight one mechanism. There are people here in the room, Johanna Oechtering from Basel, I saw, who are certainly much more capable about talking uh, about this cascade. Just um, suffice to say, complement cascade is a very important and potentially central eff effector uh, mechanism in NMOSD. The complement cascade can be roughly divided into sort of activation mechanisms. On the left-hand side here, we are talking about antibody-mediated uh, 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 activation, so the classical pathway. Then there is an amplification step, and then there is an effector pathway uh, with the membrane-attacking complex. And currently, we're looking at terminal complement inhibition with different substances. What is the presumed role of the complement? We believe that really the complement is associated with the astrocyte um, destruction, the initial astro astro astrocytopathy uh, mediated by the anti-aquaporin-4 autoantibodies. Now, we do have eculizumab already in our treatment armamentarium for myasthenia gravis and for NMOSD. Here is a further development of the same principle, uh, ravulizumab, which binds to the same epitope as eculizumab, but is engineered to have a prolonged half-life, really which would prolong the uh, application interval to every eight weeks instead of now with uh, eculizumab every two weeks. What are the data that these have been published last year? It's again some, something like a black and white picture, like we have seen with Aculizumab, where we just have a little um, uh, change in the uh, uh, actively treated group. Notably, the comparator group, the placebo group, was the historical group carried forward from the Aculizumab trial. So, this is a certain caveat. Authors and the company uh, justify that with ethical aspects. I can follow that to a part. Interesting that also uh, the uh, agencies uh, did follow that. There are class effects, class side effects with meningococcal infections, something that, of course, we know from eculizumab. This is also carried over here in the substance. Now, let me try to finish up with the pipeline. What are we looking at? And here again, trying to talk about something like progression. This is something w w which was somewhat even overwhelming in the scientific um, communication of last year, right? So we did talk about PERA, how to tackle that. We did talk about biological underpinnings. Here, a summary by Viong. Uh, what would a substance have to fulfill in order to tackle meaningfully uh, progression. It certainly would have to enter the CNS, that's quite clear. It would have to, and I tried to indicate that in my earlier slides, um, the adaptive immune uh, reaction. It would have to uh, somehow interfere with microglial and macrophage um, activation. Ideally, it would also have direct sort of neuroprotective or even remyelination roles. And the hype, of course, for Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors comes from the fact that several of these aspects indicated by an asterisk have been proven, at least experimentally, 
for BTK inhibitors. And yes, we do have interesting data that some of the pathology may really be beneficially influenced. For example, the slowly evolving lesions, the cells, which may represent some part of this underlying uh, pathology, where evobrutinib really the current one of the current um, uh, currently investigated uh, uh, substances really did have an age de uh, uh, sorry concentration dependent effect. So it came somewhat as a surprise that shortly before Christmas there was this press release that the primary endpoint annualized relapse rate in this study with everbrutinib or in these two parallel studies were just not met. Why is that? We don't know. We don't have any additional um, data on that. But just remember what I mentioned before from the Uplituximab trial, um, the 0.2 annualized relapse rate for terafunamide. So here, something is interesting, obviously, in the terafunamide comparator. So really unclear to this time point what we're talking about. Uh, we will have to see until we see more study data. I anticipate more data to be uh, ready this year on different um, other um, BTK inhibitors, which one has to say, at least in vitro and experimentally, behave differently to evobrutinib. And here, of course, especially the highlighted trials in progressive um, MS and especially also non-relapsing SPMS, will be very helpful. Now, also indicated by Professor Peel before, novel approaches. Um, last year, there has been the presentation of data of a CD40 ligand inhibitor. What is that? CD40 ligand and CD40 receptor interaction is very important in the crosstalk between T cells and B cells on one hand side and T cells and innate immune cells, immature disease and uh, uh, dendritic cells and macrophages on the other side. So this is where again sort of like pleiotropic mechanisms this uh, agent may interfere. This is a classical phase two trial with an MRI-based um, uh, primary readout with a core phase of about 12 weeks. And then afterwards, all the patients which were under placebo were then switched to this active agent. There are different sort of um, concentrations of that active agent. The bottom line is below here in the second panel, I indicated the new or increasing enlarging T2 lesions. On the left-hand side, the patients who the left two graphs, the patients who switched from placebo into the long-term extension open label to the active substance, and you see a decrease of the lesions, uh, whereas those continuously treated with that agent had, an, had early on a reduction which was maintained and other also biochemical parameters um, underscored this finding. So this is an agent which is currently uh, going into phase three trials. One aspect I also wanted to highlight, and you have also alluded to that quickly in your discussion, um, Frederick, is the anti-FCRN antagonism. What is this and why would that be interesting for us as MS society? Because, yes, of course, we deal with antibody-mediated diseases. I'll show you which study program is on the way. So you know immunoglobulins, especially IgG, are abundantly uh, present in the body and have a relatively long half-life. Biologically, one mechanism to um, ensure this is really the anti-FCR and the neonatal FC receptor. Because what it does is normally... Um, when an IgG comes to a cell, it, is, it will be pinocytically taken up by the cell. It will then bind within an endosome to FCRNs. Uh, with, and given a certain pH level, this sort of complex will then be recycled to the cell surface where the IgG will then be released. So that means, in turn, if you block the, anti, the FCRNs by anti-FCRNs, then this recycling mechanism will be interrupted 
and uh, the IgGs would rather be uh, uh, relocated to the lysosomes where at a lower pH they will be degraded. So it's probably sufficient to say the anti-FCRN uh, strategy is something like a medical plasma exchange because it really does decrease uh, the IgGs, general IgGs, uh, 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 around 70% uh, or so. It's, it is approved um, in uh, generalized myasthenia gravis, and at least one antibody, um, the, I, I spare you the name of the antibody, is currently undergoing um, a phase uh, three trial with mock ad uh, mock antibody mediated disease, also based on some experimental findings, where um, uh, at that time Anke Salm and uh, Jana Remlinger in this uh, mock AD model did show therapeutic efficacy also on the visual system. One last thing an outlook what is the autoimmune field currently discussing? One really hot thing comes from oncology and these are the so-called CAR T-cells, or chimeric antigen receptors. Why chimeric? Because the extracellular domain of the receptor would be derived from antibodies, whereas the intracellular activation and signaling domain would be derived from T-cells. What does happen in here? The general aim is really to reboot the immune system, to reboot the immune system in a very specific manner. So you would take out immune cells by apheresis from patients. You would enrich these T cells and then design the T cells, for example, with viral transfection to express these receptors, these chimeric receptors. That currently is being done in vitro. These cells are then back, uh, infused back into the patient. The cells will then identify CD19 positive B cells. And the idea is that these T cells, these CAR T cells, will then destroy a large proportion and a large set of B cells, CD19 expressing B cells, including plasma blasts, of course. And the difference to current sort of CD20 uh, depleting agents is, of course, the depth of depletion, because the idea is really that the CAR T cell can also invade different other tissues and really uh, deplete B cells from there. So this is a concept that we have seen in lupus case reports, uh, dermatomyositis, and more recently from Germany also with myasthenia gravis. This is certainly something that we should uh, look into. Now, coming to an end, what can we currently do? I think it's quite uh, puzzling right now. So we talk about very early disability progression, PIRA. Now we understand, um, at least with the first BTK inhibitor, there is no clear-cut efficacy. We will have to see what comes out there. Is that sufficient to say we cannot do anything right now? I don't think so. I think right now, really, and this is again, uh, data by the um, MS Base Registry, it's quite clear when you look, look at the relative contribution of PIRA or relapse associated worsening to another meaningful endpoint for the patient, secondary progression, then it really appears that both do contribute, but at least in this um, summary, uh, relapse associated worsening does have a very profound impact, which of course can be modulated by treatment. So again, I believe currently there's just no point of therapeutic negligence. It's still the case for early and efficient treatment. However, again, as Professor Peel indicated, um, there are other aspects. Let, let's not um, uh, uh, play down other aspects like, for example, um, the quality of life and the depression aspects, fatigue. Um, a field which I have neglected for a long time is um, something like mindful-based training, something I, until last week, wasn't even aware of how to do it. I, I got taught. Uh, but meanwhile, there is good data out there that these kinds of also meditation techniques combined maybe with 
with, for example, neurocognitive training may have meaningful effects uh, in different domains for our patients. And this is a study which is being conducted uh, by Iris Katharina Penner uh, in Bern together with the Austrian colleagues. Now, talking about modifiable um, factors coming to an end, um, modifiable psychosocial factors, I like to highlight this slide because I think unless you really have a controlled cl clinical trial, you cannot conclude too much. Really, um, this comes from Iran, and this tells you that being homeless is not good for the MS, and being divorced is not good for the MS. Being married is, however, good for MS. And now comes the very important aspect. Once your spouse dies, it's also very good for the MS. <laughs> so you're not quite sure what I can take out of that. Uh, however, you know, be careful with the data we're having. So this is the summary. It was alluded to the update of the Swiss treatment recommendations. Thank you to all the colleagues who from different um, uh, centers participated. You may ask yourself, we have the work, what for? It's scientifically, you know, I mean, it's a national guideline to improve somehow the uh, treatment landscape in, in Switzerland. And uh, as Professor Peel said, uh, not to have too much heterogeneity country-wise. I hope we can achieve that. Do we have a readout? Not really. However, this is the recent metric. Uh, so we had a full text view of 700 times, 720 times. Data from FMH says we have 724 neurologists. So only three neurologists in Switzerland have not read our article. Thank you very much. Thank you.